Hello, everyone, and welcome to Friday Nightmares Podcast. I am one half of your hosting team, Heather Powell, coming to you from beautiful Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And with me tonight is... Scott Crawford, recording in my horror movie dungeon basement uh, in Swartz Creek, Michigan, where, yeah, the basement has kind of become my home lately. <laughs> <laughs> We've all become basement drillers, huh? We sure have. <laughs> so update, uh, this is our second podcast in two weeks. We, we heard Tim Davis's uh, request from the Horror, Re- the Horror for Dummies, I almost said Horror Returns, Horror for Dummies <laughs> uh, podcast loud and clear that he called us out and thanked us and, and said how great you were, Scott, and how you're basically a veteran. And I'm doing pretty good for a new kid on the block, which I thought was pretty nice of him to say. Um, that was at the end of their, I guess you could say, Outbreak Contagion Cabin Fever episode that they did. This That's before the most recent one that they just covered on uh, Velociraptor or, or Velocipastor Veloci- 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 and Veloci- Tammy and the T-Rex. <laughs> <laughs> they're so oh my gosh him and daniel daniel is his name are so yep. funny anyway they so tim said i need more friday nightmares and well you know scott and i are just so busy <laughs> not going anywhere um that we thought that we would oblige and plus with our creature features that we're looking at we're looking at doing a three-part series because creature features are very very in depth and we yeah. wanted to kind of look at them in three different chunks and yet again these are our versions of these chunks we may leave out movies that you may love and adore but please feel free to talk about them on the facebook page just because we don't talk about them doesn't mean they're not important exactly and yep if we forget something you know feel free to always mention it to us because it gives us something if we haven't seen it to watch it later and that's all we can do right now yeah i say i don't know how many movies i've watched in this time you know, it's funny. Like, so the border's closed between Canada and the United States. And I've been on several podcasts this week. And I feel like I'm breaking the news to people who live anywhere outside of the state of New York and Michigan. <laughs> like, right. No one else knows that Canada has shut down their borders um, with the states. And it was a mutual agreement uh, between our two countries, which is awesome because we're actually really big allies. So I'm really happy to see that. Um, hmm. Our, our leaders were able to work effectively <laughs> together on that, but commercial trade is still happening. So unfortunately, even if we wanted to get together, we couldn't. We're not going to be allowed to cross the border either way. So hopefully yeah. our two countries can um, get Swap past this. this issue and this sickness and we can connect before 2021. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Like I was telling you yesterday, hopefully this is done before like, you know, summer's over because I'd like to actually like hang out with you during the summer and like either come visit you or vice versa. Well, yeah. And um, Scott got his enhanced license and he was going to come to big old Canada for the first time and experience the beautifulness at Sarnia and Windsor and all those really, really like classy areas of Canada. But unfortunately, <laughs> he uh, will not be doing that. And we were we had plans to go to some conventions and uh, there was a concert that we, we were going to check out. Chris Jericho, for anyone that watches AEW, his van, Fozzie, is coming to. What's the name of the bar near you? Uh, it's the Machine Shop. Machine Shop. And uh, Scott got tickets because he was so excited. And they were pretty cheap, though, weren't they, Scott? Yeah, I think they were like uh, 20 bucks a piece. Yeah, it's pretty, not bad. Not bad. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so, you know. Well, here's <laughs> hoping that the concert will still go on because that's like the end of July. So, fingers yeah. crossed. We'll see. Yeah, fingers crossed indeed, right? So I guess really what we've been up to is a lot of podcasting. I think yeah. this is our third this week. Yeah, yep, uh, yeah, yeah. And like, unless you want to count last Saturday, then it's our fourth. <laughs> yeah, so we were on The Horror Returns last Saturday night. We were working with Mr. Mark Nato and the Taminator and the Landinator, Tammy's son on tuesday night and then last night we we killed it as always at uh it's not horror okay yes and many many uh awkward and uncomfortable things were mentioned <laughs> you know it's funny if people listen to that podcast and then they listen to scott and i on here you wouldn't even think it's the same two people right <laughs> <laughs> it's so it's... inappropriate <laughs> Oh, it is. And like, you know, we try to, you know, joke around on here, but like we're, you know, more serious, but on there, that's, it's no holds barred. Yeah, we don't, we, we make jokes and we may swear and stuff like that, but it's a fairly clean 
podcast that we do here. Yeah. Um, not so much for the other one, but, uh, <laughs> I blame, I blame nudie. He brings it out of all of us. <laughs> that that's definitely the cause <laughs> and Android virus who also has Android vision, which is a great YouTube, I guess it's YouTube where you watch and whatever. It's a chat room and, um, it's a lot of fun. He usually hosts it at the end of every month and he always chooses a really ridiculous move, but he's a really, yep. he's a really fun guy. Um, but I've been watching a lot of movies and we'll get into what we've been watching, but I guess, I think you have something to address. Scott, that's near and dear to your heart. Yeah, um, unfortunately, it's not good news. Um, earlier this week, I know most of the horror community already like knows about it, but unfortunately, we had the passing of one of horror legends, Stuart Gordon, who was the director of Reanimator, From Beyond, Dolls, uh, Dreams in the Witch House, Black Cat, the two Masters of Horror episodes. Um, and just so many more. Like, he even wrote the screenplay for Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Did he really? Yes, he did. I had no idea about that. Wow. That's really yes. cool. So he is, like, a legend. He did a lot of, like, he like he does a lot of, like, the Lovecraftian stuff for, like, the early 80s, late 90s. And wow. I think even early 2000s, he did, like, Dagon, which was also a pretty interesting movie. But, yeah, I just wanted to give a uh, shout out here for him because, yeah, he was one of my... He was probably my second favorite horror director, like right next to John Carpenter. And yeah, this one, this one sucked waking up to see, cause it was, I think the news broke at like three in the morning. So when I woke up at like six 30 in the morning, that's all I seen in my newsfeed was plastered rest in peace, Stuart Gordon. So not a great way to wake, start, start my morning. And to note um, on top of that, Scott is an essential worker and is going to work every day well, my ass is sleeping in, and he sends me all this information when I <laughs> wake up. Yeah, but I'm just like giving her all the info before she's even awake, and that way she just has it when she's right when she wakes up. I am working from home, but yeah, it's it's definitely more relaxed hours than what he's doing. I didn't realize he did all that. Reanimate Reanimator is a great film. Yeah. Gosh, that's such a good movie. Yeah, and From Beyond is one of my favorites. I love Dolls. Dolls was a classic. Like, have you seen that one? I don't think I've seen Dolls. No. Okay, one of these days we'll have to watch that. Well, you I, know what? God's lots of time. I could watch it any time. That is true. <laughs> uh, he also did a movie called Robot Jocks. Ooh, that sounds right up my alley. Yeah, so I think you might get a kick out of that one, but it's kind of like uh, I've seen someone re- uh, referring to it as like the Pacific Rim of the 80s. Ooh, that sounds, uh, wow, that sounds enticing. Yeah, it's pretty uh, cheesy, entertaining, and kind of awesome. <laughs> but That's yeah. Awesome. I, just wanted to say rest in peace Stuart Gordon you will be uh you'll be missed but you will never be forgotten you will live long live on in your work and I think that's the awesome thing about people that are in film no matter what their role may be they live through their work right yeah. like generations upon generations uh can enjoy their film and I guess the thing, same thing can be said about podcasters I know on uh kill the cast fourth year anniversary show kind of talked about how important it was that his daughter and um, his son would be able to listen to him on his podcast recordings I don't know what age he thinks is appropriate for them to start listening to some of those episodes but absolutely um but yeah I think it's so true and they can live forever and everyone can and people can continue to enjoy their impact yeah and I was saying since you brought up podcasters living on that reminds me of uh the one of the first shows I ever uh, got introduced to was the horror news radio and uh, one of my favorite ho- uh, hosts on there was Santos the Black Saint. And unfortunately, like, I got to play video games with him and stuff. And he shared my articles around when I first started in pop horror. And then, unfortunately, he just passed away one day. And, oh, it was devastating. And I still, to this day, will go back to old episodes of theirs just to listen to his voice. And that's incredible, right? It's almost like the memory can stay with us. And for some people, that's painful. But I think that it's really nice that we can continue to celebrate someone and yeah. celebrate them through their work so rest in peace Stuart gordon thank you for all you've done for us horror fans and we will definitely continue to to live live on watching your movies and all that kind of good jazz yep exactly so what we've been watching <laughs> with all of our time yeah. Mr. crawford would you like to go first uh sure um I know we got a bunch of 2020 watches we can talk about, but I wanted to kind of start off with a couple of slightly older films like last year, year before. And, but I ended up uh, checking out 
uh, the Saska sisters remake of David Cronenberg's Rabbit. Oh. Which I have to say, like, I was, I will, right off the bat, I'll say, I was not a big fan of the original Rabbit. All right, every horror fan, get your pitchforks. I know. <laughs> but, you are entitled to your opinion, Scott. I am, I know. <laughs> but, but yeah, I tried watching it, wasn't a big fan, so I had, like, better hopes for this one because i'm like well you know it's saska sisters it's a modern take on this maybe it'll do something that will entice me to watch it and yeah i was really impressed like and it almost gave me uh what would you call like almost like flashbacks to what's going on now like because there's like quarantining and stuff like that that goes on so were you like elmo in the mean or the chihuahua and like (laughs) stuff flashing around you (laughs) Yeah, I'm going, oh, the toilet paper shortage of 2020. <laughs> someone, someone offered you a Corona beer and you were like, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, back to the movie. <laughs> oh, but yeah, it's pretty much about a woman that uh, gets in a horrific accident and she ends up uh, uh, being pretty much mutilated. Like she worked in the uh, fashion industry and was not a model, but she was the one that made the dresses and stuff like that. Mm. And uh, after the accident, like she was horribly mutilated, couldn't even open her jaw or anything like that. And so she heard about this uh, new age plastic surgery. So she went to try it and well, let's just say the surgery worked, but kind of became, she kind of became something more than human at the same time. Oh, and yeah, it's got some interesting body horror elements and like zombie style rabid creatures running around and stuff. It's pretty gory um, and pretty tense. And yeah, I really enjoyed it. That's awesome. It sounds like it was a, a good film and you're happy with the watch. So where did you watch it on? Shutter? Uh, nope, actually uh, Plex. Plex. Oh. <laughs> Because we have a good friend that shares his flex with all of us. Yep. <laughs> we are very thankful for that friend. I guess, I guess, should I go next? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, we'll go back and forth. Um, so I watched the, the last key for Insidious. Oh, so nice. As, uh, as I'm sure all of my, or my, our dedicated, such an only child, <laughs> our dedicated listeners know, um, I've, been, I've been following the Insidious franchise. So I just watched the fourth one. And oh man, Lin Shay, mm, Lin Shay, like that is now my like go-to woman that I want to meet. That I will pay the money at a convention whenever they start happening again um, to go meet. Um, Lin Shay is awesome. I oh, would love to man. meet her. You know, and I gotta give the Insidious franchise credit for a movie that I don't know if they planned on making a sequel at the end of that first one, but they've really tied this story in together really well. There may be other fans out there that are like, nah, Heather, I don't think so. I dug it. I liked it. I would definitely say this one is probably the weaker one of the franchise. Like, it's not as good, but it's still pretty decent. It is still a good watch. It's better than some... Because I've been doing all new watches, and I have 50 first-time watches from anything other than 2020, and then 29 2020 hits, I've seen some pretty uh, rough films. So, this is pretty (laughs) good. Um, So, I loved it, and I don't know, when theaters open again, I really (laughs) look forward to seeing the fifth one this year. Yeah, and uh, since you brought it up, yeah, I ended up watching the first and second one finally. And what did you think? I am really digging them. I uh, I was kind of, when they first came out, one of those type, like, oh, this just looks like uh, jump scares, blah, 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 blah. And I didn't want to give it a chance. Yep. And then, you know, hearing everybody talk about it, it, you know, kind of in, uh, intrigued me. And then hearing you go on about it and, like, saying how sucked in you were and watched all three, like, back to back to back, I was like all right, I got to give these a shot. And I was able to find the first two streaming for free. So I checked those out and I think I like the second one a little better than the first one. Yeah. I like the second one a lot. I I, I like the second and the third. I like the third. Some people don't like the third. I thought it was fun and like, it was scary at parts. Like it was good. Yeah. Cause that's how I felt about part two. There's some really creepy elements in that one. Like, the whole concept, right? The whole concept of the beyond. And I believe in all that stuff. Like, I am a full invested believer in the afterlife and in ghosts and all that stuff. So, it and demons. So, that was speaking my language. Right. Yeah, and I'm I'm kind of, like, in between there. Like, I believe that there is, but I don't have – it's hard to prove. 
So basically, Scott would want to play with the Ouija board, and I'd be leaving his house. <laughs> nope. I know. Like, I, I'm at that point where if someone said, hey, do you want to play with the Ouija board? I'm going, no. Nah. I've seen too many movies to even chance it. Why take the risk, right? Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I'm I'm pumped for the fifth one. I'm, uh, I do believe things will go back to normal. People are really, you know, and I don't want to harp too much on this because I understand that it's a really sensitive topic for a lot of people out there. And absolutely, we need to be cautious. Um, we need to stay home when we can, wash our hands, all that stuff. But I do believe this will end eventually and we will go back yeah. to a normal life. And, and, you know, I think we've learned a lot from this. So I do believe theaters will be open again. And I do believe, hopefully, I'll be seeing this theater in 2020, if not 2021. You know what? Right. I gotta wait, I gotta wait. Right, and I, oh, since you brought up theaters, actually, this I just read about this in uh, China and I thought this was interesting. So, you know, China's finally slowly recovering from everything that happened there. And theaters started opening back up, but since, you know, it was such a long time without the theaters, people were probably not going to want to go back out and pay money for that stuff. Mm -hmm. So what they ended up doing was playing, like, a couple older films, and it was free admission. Oh, nice. People would come back in. All you had to do is, if you wanted concessions, you buy someone from the concession stand. But nice. they'd play, like, la movies from last year or the year before, just to kind of get people to get accustomed to coming back out again. Well, in China, it was there. And I think people forget about the dense population base in China, right? Like, yeah. I think, you know, I think it's um, North American. Sometimes we lack the education to understand what other population densities look like. And I, I can imagine a lot of fear. So I think that's a great idea to get people back out going and um, using the cinema and just getting out of their house again. It's hard because we're being told to, to stay in, stay in. And they had walls built and stuff to keep people in. Like, they were very, yeah. like, very containment. So, you know, that's a big change. So what a great idea for that theater. That's awesome. Yeah, so I'm like that may be something we'll end up seeing like after this is all said and done happening just to kind of get people to come back out. Who knows? I'll be out. I'll be yeah. the, the first day things are lifted. Oh, I'll be God. running down the streets, throwing my money at every, getting, I'll be getting my Starbucks. I'll be going to the <laughs> bar. I'll be going to the well, movie theater. I think I will wait a couple days because I think everybody will be doing that. <laughs> and that's more of the reason why I want to. More of the reason. Anyway, on to you. What's your next movie? Uh, the next one I checked out uh, upon one of your recommendations, and that was Countdown. And, wow, that was a pretty fun film. Right? Yeah, I I didn't know much about it besides a little bit that you told me. And, yeah, I do have to say it definitely has that uh, Final Destination vibe to it, which, being a Final Destination fan, I was all about. It's yeah. very teeny right like it's a very basic plot basic concept but I, and i think those people forget about these movies so when we were younger i don't i i can't remember if you were big into like i know what you did last summer the faculty and stuff oh, like yeah that. oh yeah i right? was a 90s baby so so those were the teenage movies for us right yeah. this is what bloom house is doing now yeah, exactly. Right? So so a movie like Countdown, the season horror fan may walk into it. Like, first of all, look at the movie, look who's making it, and, like, <laughs> right, set your exactly. expectations accordingly, right? Um, and, and I really, I thought the concept was cool. Like, I thought it was using technology in a way that wasn't, like, um, cheesy or wasn't, uh, you know, outdated and was a fun little film. Yeah, and it used, like, that app that you like you'll see like the weird things on facebook like oh click here to find out when you die type deal yeah and like that just goes like and it's that whole question of do i really want to know and it kind of plays on that which is kind of neat do you want to know scott would you would you download that app nope i would just ignore it same with me <laughs> <laughs> like i would live my life and well whatever happens happens i just don't want i don't want to know and be like having that on my shoulder the rest of my life you see, I'm really aiming on being that cool 80-year-old in the old age home. Like, Scott's heard me talk about this before. I want to be smoking pot, drinking with the kids, and telling them, like, <laughs> sex stories from when I was younger. And I'd be, like, the cool Miss Powell that they want to go hang out with. That's my goal in my 80s. If I make it to that point, I have reached my biggest life goal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you'll do it. You'll be you'll be that cool lady. <laughs> you think so? Yeah. I hope so. I hope they just don't humor me. But I'm really glad that you liked it and that you checked it out because it's got a lot of hate. 
and I, I don't know, like, no, set your expectations. Like, it's, yeah. it's no different than a Final Destination. Now, someone could argue Final Destination is better, especially the first one. Um, I would put this somewhere between three and four in quality. Ooh. I, I really like three. I like three I, I, a lot. I, I like three. I just don't like four. So I'm going three and five. Okay. Okay. Three and five. Maybe that's better. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, 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 that's the one out of the destination series that I, I'll still watch it, but it's my least favorite. Well, it looks like a made for TV movie. That's it, probably why. Yeah. Right? And the terrible 3d just does not work when the 3d things all pretty much done now. And it's like, Oh look, a tire flying right at my screen. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> like every film was 3d. Um, oh I'm, gosh. <laughs> so I, many. A podcast that did an amazing job of covering that is Exploding Heads. Oh, yes. And did you listen to their their episode where they covered all of them? Yes, I did. Yeah, so they're they're about to go Patreon, but for all those people that haven't checked them out yet, I really recommend listening to Exploding Heads, and I love that Final Destination coverage that they did. Yeah, they did an amazing job with that. And they always do an amazing job. Yeah, they do. They really do. We're just trying to learn Brandon. (laughs) I love Brandon. I I love Brandon, Christian, and Dave. I think they're awesome. Yeah, I just got to pick on Brandon because he likes to pick on me. So I'm I'm in love with Brandon. He should know that now. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh la Derek, la. Someone, Derek B said that on one of his podcasts. It was really funny. I don't even know if Brandon ever heard it. I doubt he listens to this one, so he won't know either. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I guess I should go to mine that I've been watching. I'm going to, I think I'm going to keep it old school, like what you've been doing. Well, not really old school, but maybe more um, throwback. I watched Trick. Oh, okay. From uh, last year. From last year. And that also got a lot of hate. I honestly didn't mind it. I thought it was okay. Like, I don't think it was the best Halloween movie. I preferred Haunt from yeah, last Haunt year a awesome. lot more. Um, but I thought the concept wasn't bad, what they went with in the film. Um, I thought there was some pretty good chase scenes. But I the ending really was a little cheese cheese. Uh, clearly low budget, but Omar Epps was in it, and I felt like I was oh, going nice. back in time. Seeing <laughs> Jamie Kennedy, I didn't even recognize him. <laughs> Wait, J- Jamie Kennedy was in that too. Jamie Kennedy was in it, and nice. he looks like he looks rough. So, um, but yeah, honestly, for a free watch during this time for basic slasher, I've seen worse. It was okay, but I don't think it's going to go down in any kind of oh, man, it's Halloween, better pull out trick. Like, I don't think it's going to be one of those movies. Right. Yeah, because I heard it was kind of like a uh, partly police procedural, in a way. Yeah, like, I I didn't really get that. I I got that they were just, I liked the concept, you know, and I don't want to give too much away. I, I liked the concept that they tried to do with it. I thought it was a little more unique than what we have seen in the past with Halloween movies. I just, and it's clearly low budget, right? Like you watch this movie and this mess is like when, our, when our apps and like Jamie Kennedy are your big name actors, like, yeah. That's well, and also, <laughs> sorry, Tom Atkins was in it too. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. He was in it. He was funny. Like he was probably the highlight of it. Um, but like, it is what it is, but I still thought it was enjoyable. But would I be like, Oh man, next Halloween, do I need to watch it? If I didn't have anything else to do and I was super bored, yeah, maybe. But I don't think it's a must-go-to. Okay. Yeah, it's something I'll probably eventually watch just because, you know, with the challenge that we've done with ourselves. And it's if I see it, I'll be like, yeah, why not throw it on? Yeah, it's definitely not something that you're going to be like, oh, man, I wasted my time. Like, we have watched movies together where we have wasted our time. Yeah, and there's this, a couple uh, that I've, I, I'm going to be bringing up later that, we wa- that I wasted yeah, my time. But this isn't one of them. I, I think it got a lot of hate. And yet again, you know, and I'm not trying to – you know, get too much on this high horse because I talk about it every episode, but like, know your expectations. Yeah. Like, look at the movie, look who's in it, look, you know, as you're watching it, look at the budget. You know, it is what it is. It's not the best low budget movie, absolutely not at all, but I don't think it's absolutely as bad as everyone has said it was. I think it's okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll have to give that a watch then at some point. I think I'd probably get a kick out of it. You probably would. Because you and I have very similar tastes. Yeah, I think you would think it's fun, honestly. Nice. Okay, sweet. Yeah, and then uh, I guess I'll go with my last uh, older film, uh, and then we'll talk. I can talk some newer films after that. Um, but I ended up checking out. It was on. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I think this might have been Shutter or Tubi, but it was uh, Howl. Oh, I love that! Oh my goodness, you finally saw it! I did. Oh, and, nice. 
Yeah, because I was just kind of in a uh, werewolf kick because a uh, little behind the scenes stuff here. We were originally going to bring up werewolves and talk about them in this episode, but we're deciding to like make another an episode dedicated to werewolf stuff later. Is kind of what we were thinking. Uh, am I right about that? Yeah, and we also know that Jamie um, and her husband Brian have an awesome podcast called Liken It where oh, they yep. focus on werewolves. So we didn't, you know, we didn't, we wanted to do it justice. Like if we're going to talk about werewolves, we'll talk about it in our own style in our own way. But if you are craving knowing about werewolves before then, you can definitely check out uh, Liken It. And I believe that's on the Horophilia Network. Yep, it is. Uh, but yeah, I I was kind of just starting to watch some werewolf films because I got in that kick, especially after I watched uh, Late Phases that I talked about on the last episode. So I was like, you know, I bet that's like one genre that I love that I just, don't have a lot of knowledge in so i was like screw it i'll watch howl and yeah that was a lot of fun i love that movie i thought it was really cool yeah i'll say it was uh pretty dang uh violent and tense and almost reminded me of uh, a zombie movie meets werewolves because of how quickly they turned and stuff like that absolutely now i believe tony collette's in that one is it tony collette or uh, is another person that's in it i can't remember who was you know who i'm talking about though there's a yeah. well-named actress that's that's in it and um the characters are pretty good i believe most of them are british or some of them yep. are british um and they're on a train and and you know stuff goes down with werewolves and it's it's good train horror in the middle of the forest like secluded like that like what would you do right like yeah <laughs> you're you're pretty much screwed at that point like you can't run outside because well werewolves they're faster mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you're stuck inside well you're just uh you're just pretty much uh, just a fish in a barrel, just waiting for it to be ripped open. Yeah, and the special effects, like, I don't know what the budget was on that. I feel like it was a pretty decent budget. Yeah, I think it was, like, I'd say about mid-tier budget, because uh, I did notice that majority of it was in uh, the darkness. Mm. So it is easy to hide a lot of werewolf stuff in the darkness. Like, they, I think, like, because, yeah, even the lights in the train ended up going out after a while, and it was just kind of like that flickering light and stuff like that. But, yeah, they... You know, we've talked about this before, but they use their budget well. And yeah. they had some uh, interesting and very disturbing looking werewolves. Yeah, and... I really I really enjoyed it. I, I It's one of my top werewolf movies. I think it's just well done. Um, and I just think the character development in it is there. You know, I enjoy werewolf stuff. I think werewolves, the concept of it is really cool. Uh, and I haven't watched enough of them to really be skilled enough to, to know what's – like I've watched the popular ones. Yep, that's no, pretty much how I was. Like, I haven't watched a lot of the other ones, so I think once I really, really, like, dive into them more, I'll have more to say. But in terms of, like, basic bitch, no- basic bitch knowledge of werewolf movies, this one was pretty good. Yep, I had a lot of fun with this one, and I definitely recommend it. I wish I knew ex- where I'd found it, because I can't remember right now. I watched I- it on Prime. Okay, maybe that's where it was. I mean, Prime Canada and Prime U.S. is a bit different, but we do have some similarities, too. Yeah, sometimes they don't always match up, which is hilarious when we find that out, actually. <laughs> right. Right? It's so Especially weird. when we're doing research for our show, and it's like, oh, yeah, these movies we need to watch. Oh, I got them, as Heather's saying, and I'm going, oh, shit, I got to rent them. What the hell? <laughs> it's ridiculous, some of the cases, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think I have any older ones. Like, I was going to talk about One Cut of the Dead, but... I, I think the only thing I'll say about that is I can see why there's mixed opinions on it. I enjoyed it. I thought it was cool. I thought it was different. Um, I knew too much going in of what was going to happen. Oh, so really? I think if I, yeah, because I've listened to podcasts and stuff like that. I still enjoyed it, but I think this was one case where the less you know, possibly the more you'll like it, but it's a different take. Yeah, cause it's one that I meant to watch and get around to watch it last year, but I wasn't too sure if, uh, if it was going to be my bag or not. like I think that it could have, I would have made it, when we were on the uh, top 10 show with Mark Nato, I probably would have had it as an honorable net engine. Okay. Because I can see why people would argue that it's not horror, and that's fine. I do see where it is, where people would argue that it is. But I did think it's a really well done film. And yeah, I heard it was cool. really good. It's cool. It's a cool concept, and I think it deserves to be acknowledged. Honestly, Scott, I would recommend checking it out. Okay. Yeah, I just got to be uh, make sure that I have no distractions since it's subtitled. Yeah, you are going to be reading, and you yep. read good, so make sure that you're <laughs> all set to do that. Yeah, because I get easily distracted, like, because 
a lot of the time when I'm watching movies, I'm usually multitasking, doing other things. So when it comes to like subtitled films, I got to make sure I'm like, all right, not doing anything. I'm going to sit down and watch this and give it my full attention. Yeah, you got to with subtitles for sure. Yeah. That's why I've held off on a couple of the 2020 watches that are on Shutter right now because I'm just like, well, I need to give those my attention and i am got too much going on right now. Yeah. Like the Golden Glove is one of those. Yep. Like I, that's what I was bringing up too. Yeah, like I, I saw that when I talked about it on the Rotten Round Table. You really need to focus on it, and you need to be in the right headspace because it's dirty, it's grimy. It felt so good to hear Mark Nato say that he also thought it was dirty and grimy, and that you need a shower afterwards because you do. But man, is it well acted! Like, wow, very, very well acted. Um, heavy though, heavy. Yeah. There's uncomfortable scenes, very uncomfortable scenes, like Lord of Chaos scenes. Oh, that wow. Some of the okay. scenes in there that are uncomfortable, I would say for me, were comparable in Golden Glove, the Golden Glove. Okay, wow. Yeah. Yeah, so that's definitely on my list to watch. I just got to make sure I'm focused. Yep, absolutely. Let's see, what one will I jump into here? I guess I'll talk about uh, one of the not so great films that I've seen from 2020. And like you were saying, when you see the like see a movie or see a trailer or something like that, you gotta like set your expectations. I had my expectations set pretty low for this one, and wow, it still was even worse than that. <laughs> like it just, and it's not even like the fault of the characters, but this is the the Doctor's Monster, which I talked about on <laughs> yeah. the horror cast. But like this just looked like it was probably something that should have just been done with friends and almost looked like a school project, like just super, super low budget. But it amazes me that this is even uh, available to watch on prime. Cause yeah, this is just, it's a retelling of Frankenstein's monster in a way. And it's just eh, not that good. Like bless their hearts. They tried, but it just, the budget wasn't there and no one really knew how to act or understand, understood what their characters were going for. So like, it was just an all around just yeah don't watch movie for me like i wouldn't i if it's streaming for free and you're curious which i think it is streaming for free now on amazon prime i was like go ahead and watch it it's short it's like an hour and 10 minutes but yeah don't rent this it was just mm, unless you want to give your money to some indie directors but yeah this was just not a good one for me yeah you've really done a good job of not selling it <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay though sometimes you know it's 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 just not worth it sometimes our time is precious not right now, but generally <laughs> right. speaking, it can be. Um, but no, even, even you know, all this joking about quarantine and social distancing aside, you still want to enjoy what you're watching. So I think that's really good feedback. Yeah, because it, it felt like a chore. Yeah, and that's not fun. Something shouldn't feel like a chore, right? Like something that we love, like watching horror movies, shouldn't feel like a chore. Right, exactly. Um, I guess one that I want to talk about that I didn't really um, go into too much on the Rotten Round Table was The Grudge. And my disappointment. Yes. Oh, my disappointment. Because, and you know what? Lacey, Lou, and uh, Dan Chase told us on a group chat that it was going to be bad. I listened to the Fresh Cuts. I heard what they all had to say. Uh, so I wasn't going into this thinking, oh, it's going to be a masterpiece. Right. But, Neither was I. But man, like it. I. I it. Yeah. Why? Why? <laughs> It was so pointless. Yeah, and I just feel like they, first of all, I'm going to give a spoiler away. Spoiler alert, this happens within the first two minutes of the movie. Um, the, the ghost comes to America, and, like, it was almost like Fievel goes west and, like, coming to America. <laughs> like, it had almost the same sense of a mouse getting on a boat and traveling to America. Like, it just, when it started with that, I was like, what? Like it just, and then the ghosts were different ghosts. They weren't even the Japanese ghosts because yeah, the curse got passed on. Curse got passed on and was infecting white people and turning white people into the ghosts. And they're not just, scary. No, they were not scary at all. They were laughable. Like when you're laughing out loud at a ghost, I've been more scared by public service announcements that the federal government has put out in Canada <laughs> than I was afraid of the grudge. I was more scared of movies like Paranormal uh, Activity and stuff like that, where you don't even see a ghost, but it's there. And it's like, yeah. And you can't even blame this on budget. No. Like you can't be like, oh, they didn't have the budget. 
Yeah, and the and the char- characters were all like they could have been cardboard cutouts, and it would have been about the same impact. Um, it, it was just I think that the script was poor, the concept was poor. You know, bless their hearts for trying to bring it into 2020, I guess, and trying to. The it wasn't even based in 2020; it was based back in the early 2000s. But um, yeah, it uh, it just made my head hurt. And I saw Rings recently. Um, as well. I actually haven't added it to my list, but I've seen Rings, and I, I'm a big fan of the first Ring. Big fan. I even liked the second Ring. And the Rings here, like the final Rings, like it wasn't the best, but it, they didn't mess it up nearly as bad <laughs> as this movie messed up the oh. grudge stuff. It just, you know, I, I props to the people that maybe, I don't know, the costume design. Like, I'm trying to find something nice to say. I just, I just think it's a shame that they put together a story that was just non-interesting actors and, and not actors, but characters that didn't have much to work with and, and a plot where you really didn't care about what yeah. happened to anybody. You didn't care. Yeah. Cause it felt very cobbled together. Yes. Yes. Like, and, and it felt rushed. Mm-hmm. And I just, yeah. I, Cause I like, uh, you know, I like you, I like, I like the uh, grudge movie, like the remake. I still need to see you on. Um, Still need to see Ringu, I've, but I do like Ring. But yeah, this one I was like, hey, this could be fun. Like I don't like. Sometimes people hate on a movie because it's big budget and it's a remake of a remake. And I was like, okay, maybe they're just being a little too harsh. No, I guess they weren't. Like, like it just wasn't that good. Like there was just all these weird things going against it. I think all that we're doing different is we're articulating specifically what we didn't like. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't say it was it was it was a poor plot design. It was a poor character development. Like the plot and the writing just wasn't there. If they, I, and I understand that it was a reimagining, and that's fine. But it's a it's a great Japanese folklore. And in the original one, the main character, or sorry, the American remake, the first one, Sarah Michelle Gellagher is white. She's she's super white. She's like poster girl for white chick. And right. The scene where I can't remember which ghost it is or entity is coming down the stairs after her. Yes. Now I'm kind of giving that away. Sorry. Hopefully people have seen it. It came out in like 2003 or whatever. Um, that was creepy. Yeah, that was. Like there was none of that in this one. No, even the ghosts sounded like the noise they made sounded so generic and bad. Cause remember I was making fun of it. Like what yeah. the hell it was this like a, store brand version of like a Kmart version as yeah. well as a version. Um anyway, it just it's a shame. It's a shame that um Sam Raimi has it Sam Raimi, right? Yeah, I don't think he directed it, but I think it was his he ghost house picture or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So you know can't win them all. Nope, I'll say this one will de- uh, like I have a feeling like if we did like a this won't even be at the bottom of the list of things because I've seen some bad stuff. Like this is just middle of the road. It yeah, it's it's definitely lower in my list, and it's just I, you know it's it's below Fantasy Island, which is saying something. Because um, Fantasy Island, yet again, not the worst movie in the entire world, but not the best either. Like it's kind of no. it's, it's just, just there, there. right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was kind of disappointing. I'll be honest, I was that was my disappointing 2020. I was hopeful, but can you yeah, that one was, like I think it pretty much met my expectations because i expected it not to be that good and i'm just like well it ended up being about what i was expecting (laughs) do you mind if i go into another one oh go for it um so something that i finally got around to watching that you covered on fresh cuts was the boy too oh yes and i uh, so i've seen the first one yay (laughs) right and i have not for people who haven't listened and the Fresh Cut episode was great. I know that uh, Venom and Mike did not enjoy it. And that's absolutely, well, I shouldn't say did not enjoy it. I don't think they enjoyed it as much as uh, the first one, I, which is fair. As much the first as I one, did. Yeah, or as much as you did. I think the first one is a better film. But this wasn't too bad. You know, I got to say for a, a movie that kind of left it hard to do a sequel at the end of the original boy, uh, they, they did a pretty good job here. I am not a fan of Katie Holmes. Sorry, Tim Davis. I know she's a girl, <laughs> but um, I am not a huge fan of her. I find her very wooden, and I don't love her, but she wasn't bad in this. No, I thought she did pretty decent. Like She did she pretty good. Yeah, I'll say she, because I'm the same way. I'm like, Katie Holmes is just kind of there. She's kind of like plain rice. You know, she's kind of just there, and, yeah. and you can throw stuff on top to make it a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but you know what? For this film, 
as much as I tease, she was fine. She was fine in the role. I believed her as a mother. It was fine. But there was some very good scenes in this, I thought, that were pretty creepy. Yeah. And I liked the route that they went. I won't, uh, I won't spoil it too much, but I think that I would agree with the statement that you really do have to like haunted doll films. Absolutely. You do have to yep. enjoy that. But, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a bad movie. I'm glad that I watched it. I don't know if I would have, you know, really needed it to be a theater watch. You saw it for like five bucks in a matinee. So yeah, that's why I like, wasn't too concerned. Cause I was like, eh, $5 matinee, not going to worry over it. But this, I, I did enjoy it. I thought it was pretty solid. Her husband was pretty good. The kid was a pretty decent actor. Um, there's some other children in there that were really, like, rude. And one of them I wanted oh, to yeah. punch in the face. So that's a, good, that's a sign yes. of a good actor. <laughs> you know, if, a, if an actor can invoke anger from you it's, or emotion from you, that's a good actor. Whether that kid is actually like that or not, it still evoked an emotion for me. So props to that kid. But, yeah, I didn't think it was that bad. Yeah, I- I thought it was uh, enjoyable because, like I was saying, I never seen the first one, and I knew like the basics of it, knew the reveal, all that stuff. But going into this one, just kind of was like, "All right, make this my first uh, movie for of this little two parter." And yeah, I'm uh, I I enjoyed it. Like it's nothing special, but it was you know a fun watch. Absolutely. Let's see what was one I could talk about. Um, well, I guess we could talk about uh, well. A little spoiler for right now. My number one film of the year right now. Mothers of Monsters. Yeah. M-O-M. What a good film. Yes. You and I decided to sit down and watch this last Sunday. Mm-hmm. And wow. I was blown away by the performances. Um, basically, it's a a single mother who is raising her child who has been videotaping her son since he was like a baby. And she thinks that he's basically a sociopath that's going to become a killer. So, and she's worried about it. So she's constantly taping him just uh, half proof. And yeah, that's all you need to know about the premise. Cause man, just the performances of these two characters, like especially the mother, I got to give her some huge props. Like she pulled off like the distressed and just exhausted character. And the son played that type of teenager or friend that we would know back in high school that was just constantly antagonistic and anti-authoritarian and was just a complete and utter prick. Someone mm-hmm. you just want to punch in the face. Mm-hmm. But man, yeah, like it has you guessing the whole the whole entire time, like just what's going on. Like you don't know until pretty much the very end. And man, that guy, yeah, I was just, in awe by this. It's kind of like found footage. Oh, so it is found footage. Yeah, it is, yeah, it yeah, is, it is found, found footage. footage. And I'm not a big fan of found footage films for the most part, but what, the way they did this one was really impressive. And yeah, I was blown away. Yeah, I think you, you said it perfectly, Scott. It's um, it's a heavy film as well. Yeah, it very heavy. It talks about some heavy issues. Uh, it was not what I expected at all. No, not uh, at all. I, I spent my whole movie going – throughout the whole movie, I was thinking, what is real? Who are you? Who has a mental illness? Do they both have mental illness? What is happening? What is not happening? Everything was a surprise for me. And I think that with this movie, one, I do think you need to enjoy found footage because it is a little choppy because it's it's – not choppy in a way that it takes away from the film, but it's showing separate video clips yeah. and stringing them together. So if that isn't your thing, and it's strung together very well, um, but if it isn't your thing, you may not like this. Uh, I do think it's a big social commentary. Oh, it definitely is. So you got to like, you know, God, you should, you probably will enjoy this more if you like social commentary. It's my number one as well. Some people won't even have it on their list. I don't think this will, I think my top five will not leave from our list, but what our lists are is the ones that inspired us the most or, or touched us or, or brought emotion out from us. So they may not be films that other people would consider a really good horror film, but for some reason it it reached to Scott and I, and it, and it talks to our own personal values or experiences or whatever. And I think definitely this movie for different reasons spoke to us. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, I was, I was expecting it to be a, 
decent film. I did not expect it to like shoot up to my number one. It's good. It's a, it's a good movie. I, I definitely think if you got to pay for it, it's worth the money. Um, yep. It's, it's good. It's a good film. Yeah. And I think it's uh, available on Amazon. Yeah. It's available on Amazon prime to rent. Is it? Okay. Yeah. And I guess the only other one that I want to talk about is the platform. Yes. You and so, I both watched this as well. We did, and it's on Shutter. Yes, it's on Shutter. Or I'm, Netflix. Netflix. Oh my gosh, look at me, Shutter, Netflix. I'm like that doesn't sound right. <laughs> it's on Netflix. Uh, unfortunately, here in Canada, we do not have the subtitled version, or I didn't see it, so I ended up watching the dub version, which for me was fine. Like I think the subtitle one would be better. The dub one was okay. I like the concept behind the story anyway. Um, if I watched the subtitled one. The, the, what I wanted to get into on uh, the Rotten Round Table that I didn't, because it's not my show, uh, but I will get into it on this show because Scott and I co-own it. <laughs> um, this, this show, I mean this show, this movie talks so much about social economic class um, and how quickly it can change. Yeah. How you can go from being a have to a have not. And this movie – is so representative of this time. We have seen people behave in ways that are really uncalled for what's happening. We live in, in first world countries, both of us. We live in countries where food is uh, ample for those can, that can afford it. Uh, there are people that live on food stamps in the States. Uh, Ontario works here in Ontario, people that rely on food banks. Uh, Scott and I are blessed. We, we don't. We, we have homes. We have a roof over our head. We have laptops and really nice things. And um, we've seen a really ugly side of humanity here. Yes, yes, we have. We've seen people hoard things. We've seen people buy more than they need. Um, we've seen people act like an apocalypse is coming because a very bad flu virus has occurred and we've been encouraged to social distance and stay at home when we can. Yeah. And wash our hands. You yeah. know, and, and and I'm not downplaying it. I think it's a very serious virus, and I think it's important that we take those precautions. But at the same time, I think Platform talked about the importance that if we all just took what we needed, there'd be enough for everyone. There is no reason yeah. right now where we should be walking around and seeing empty shelves of pasta. Yeah, or like, toilet paper or, or toilet any paper, paper product. Or or when, you know, I go to Walmart and there's no meats. This is ridiculous. Yeah, you know, We live in two countries where if you are able to walk around Walmart and purchase whatever you choose, you are doing very well. And I, I, you know, and I, I won't stay on the soapbox for too long because I don't want um, to become off as too political. But I think if you are really interested in social classism, if you understand the, the concept of taking more than you need, and if we all just took the same amount, this movie really reflects that well. Yeah, it shows the dark, un, uh, darker side of humanity that you do not want that you that you are uncomfortable seeing. Well, and it, and it, and you could kind of watch this movie and go, "Oh, well, that's them." Yeah, but I think it's it's so fitting, and I don't know if Netflix purposely released it right now or if that just happened how it came out. Um, but it's very, very fitting to what we're seeing, and I think it just. And it also allows you to realize how close we all live, right? Like how you can go from being very, very well off to not well off. Yeah. And, you know, I'm all about societal horror. I'm all about classism. Like this movie was my song. My, my, was it my song, swan, my swan song? Like it yep. was, it is, it is, you know, everything that I believe in that I, I fight for is equality and what I, and stuff like that. But it's, it's also a really good watch. It has some very, very gory scenes to it. Um, yeah yes it does some very good acting you really don't know how the movie's going to end either and that's what makes it a really good film like you don't even understand why they're all there at first and and eventually things kind of come together as to why everybody is in this situation and that's really interesting like they don't give too much away it kind of it spreads it out throughout the film yep and it was perfectly paced yes very well paced very very well paced and i don't want to give too much away um so but that's my own personal feelings on it i think that it's a very well done film the acting seemed very quality to me um i don't know what language it is because i had the dub version Uh, it's uh spanish is it spanish yep i ended up Um, looking it up is it filmed in spain i'm not sure if it was filmed in spain but i know all the actors were spanish okay or could have been filmed in brazil or other countries where they speak spanish but right um it's it 
very what a concept what a concept you know yeah and these foreign films man they got balls <laughs> they do and they <laughs> they don't hold back on the punches right like shit <laughs> they will hit you and make you feel things they do and they're not afraid to go places like they, no at all um man it just makes us little north americans look so timid sometimes but um <laughs> You know, it's a it's worth the watch, but it is a heavy watch. You know, I wouldn't say watch this with your kids. Um, now, Landon, um, Tammy's son watched it, so know your kid. You know, yeah. like obviously, Landon is comfortable with concepts like this, and and Tammy and him have that relationship, and that's awesome. But you know, would I sit maybe a six year old down to watch this? Probably not. Uh, but it is a very good lesson on classism and taking what you need. Yeah, and it's definitely like it should be shown to certain people. <laughs> But you know what, though? I, I think we're all a little um, – it's human nature to want oh, yeah. to make sure you're protected and that you have all these things. And there's one thing with just making sure you have what you need and another thing with um, taking more than you need and limiting someone else's chance of survival or comfort or whatever because you've taken more than than what is needed. So. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and – I can't really add anything else to that because you just freaking covered that part beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and I didn't go into it that much on the Hot Rotten Round Table. It's not my show. It's not a political show. Um, and our show isn't super political. Well, I guess it kind of is. We do kind of delve into politics a little bit. Yeah. And I try to, like, state my opinion. And, of course, you know, I'm not saying my opinion is, is all, and, all and be all. But I think there is something to be said about taking what you need and being considerate of others like i think yeah, that's absolutely. a general human guideline that we should follow and this film does a really good job of it and it's on netflix so if you got netflix um definitely worth the watch yeah and i suggest the subtitled version i haven't checked out the dubbed version but i yeah i would say subtitled like the dub was fine for me i didn't it didn't make make it worse for me but i would have preferred the subtitle okay but yeah um i guess we can uh jump into what we've been listening to yeah do you want to go first uh yeah, uh I'm going to be talking about one that uh a lot of people probably know about, like they're really popular, but they are an indie podcast that pretty much did all of this on their own and got their fan base through Instagram, which I thought was unique cuz a lot of the podcasters I know usually use Facebook or Twitter. Mm -hmm. But this is uh Say You Love Satan, the 80s movie 80s horror movie podcast. Uh, I actually uh, just wanted to give these guys a shout out because, for one, I'm friends with all of them. I actually um, was one of the admins for their Facebook page for a while and would make posts for them and stuff like that, announcing news articles and this and that. Uh, and did that for a little while just for the fun of it and help them out to get their Facebook status a little more known. Um, but it is four people. It's uh, Jessup, Stephanie, Melissa, and John. And they always cover like an 80s, maybe an early 90s uh, horror film. I think it's Stephanie is a, a veterinarian, a veterinarian, and oh, uh, nice. Yeah, so she will have a segment that will occasionally come up called Pathology Perversions and talk about some weird uh, disease or infection and like get into like real deep scientific scientific detail about it. Um, Jessup and John are both just like horror movie nerd aficionados. They know everything. And, oh, that's cool. And John is also like a big video game nerd, so he'll talk about video games every once in a while. And then Melissa is just uh, kind of what you call yourself. Uh, basic, the basic weight bitch? Yeah, the basic weight bitch. She drinks uh, like the nice, uh, fancy, expensive rosé wines and stuff like that while she's on. And <laughs> nice. I dig her. Oh, and they're... She's my spirit, spirit animal right there. Oh, and they are hilarious. Like, pretty much you're listening to them like sober too drunk by the end of the episode at least at least on some episodes not all of them but that's awesome you can definitely tell when jessup gets drunk because he gets louder and louder and louder <laughs> and more just like saying these most absurd things but they are just purely enjoyable and entertaining and they know that they know their stuff and yeah I, the best place to find them would be on instagram or facebook I'm not sure if they're on Spotify or not, but I will find a link for their show and post it in our podcast uh, or on our show notes. Awesome. But, yes, awesome. Check out Say You Love Satan. I've listened to them when I was down last. Yes. Yes, you did, actually. Yeah, they were really, really good. They're a lot of fun. Um, I like it when podcasters, you can tell they, you know, 
I think most of the podcasts I listen to are like this, but generally like each other. Yeah. You know, that have a friendship. It's, it's a lot of, and I think they record in person, don't they? Yep. All four of them record in person, which is also another awesome. Yeah. Event. You can tell, um, you can tell that they're at least face to face, right. That they're able to read each other's uh, expression and stuff like that. It does, it does make a difference. Um, the one I want to talk about is the, is the nightclub. And this is a solo cast. And this is with Mr. Travis Maxwell Boone. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if anyone has heard of him, but he is, I think he's Southern because he sounds really sexy. And he sounds like he has this really nice accent. But more than just that, um, his first episode, he talked about the fear of Friday the 13th and what that meant to him as a kid. And he also talked about um, the Evil Dead, and he did a full review of it. And he, and almost like when he's talking, it's very, very soothing. Like he just really, really expresses what he's saying well. And for a solo caster, that is very hard to do. Yes, yeah, that is um, absolutely tough to do. Certain people do it well. Mister Watson does it very well in Horror Corridor. Um, Duncan Mick. Oh, Duncan McLeish. McLeish yep. does it very well. Um, I'm sure there's other solar casters that do it very well. But those are just the first ones that came to mind. He is very, very good. Um, I, I've enjoyed listening to his stuff quite a bit. His episodes, his first one is a little shorter. I do believe he brings in guests for some other ones as well. But I really enjoyed um, his first episode. And he aired it on September the 13th. Oh, nice. Right? So that's really cool. He is on Spotify. He is on Stitcher. Um, he is on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, um, iHeartRadio, and Radio Republic. So we will share links to him. But I definitely encourage you, to, if you like solo class and almost like a monologue-ish, check him out. He's he's quite good. Yeah, because I have I've subscribed to his uh, show. I just have not got around to it yet, but it is what I've been planning on listening to. He's wanna... very soothing, Scott. If you're having a hard day at work, put Travis on. Deal. I will and definitely do and that. And he's going to make you feel like it's all going to be okay. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and I just want to give a second little shout out to Horror for Dummies. And the reason why is because during our um, time in social distancing, the gym has been closed. And I am a gym rat. I go to the gym every day. So I have been going on 10K walks. That's what, six miles? Yeah, about American? six, six and a half miles. Yeah, let's, yeah, we'll say six and a half. That sounds more impressive. Um, and I have been listening to podcasts. And I listened to the, and I want to go find it, the Horror for Dummies podcast the other day for the coronavirus horror. Oh, yeah. I still need oh, to listen to that one. my God. These boys are so funny. Men. These men are so funny. Uh, Tim Davis and Daniel, the chemistry they have, like, I kind of feel like they're our big brothers, and I'm just trying to be as good as them. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're just so funny. And there was one part at the end where they're, like, basically talking about, you know, they cover the flu, which is a, a Korean movie. Have you even heard of this movie, the flu? No. Yeah, so they cover that movie, they cover Contagion, and they cover Outbreak, and then they talk about Cabin Fever, the original Cabin Fever, um, which is funny. The 2002 version? Yep, I like that one. Yeah. Um, and then at the end, they say something like, they're going to lick people in the grocery store. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I think Daniel said that. <laughs> so, Daniel, I want you to know that if I come to Australia, I'm going to lick your face really slow and awkward. Just <laughs> to make sure. And I'm going to drag it out as long as possible. And if Tim's there, I may do it to him, too. So once these borders get open and we all heal up, but oh, my goodness. You know, they take uh, this outbreak and they do a really good job of talking about movies with it. I don't want to say making light of it because they do – take it seriously um so if you're feeling really sensitive about corona maybe don't listen to it yet but i think they do a really good job of it and i just wanted to give them a shout out on it because i thought it was quite comical yeah because for some reason i ended up missing that episode because i started listening to the velocipaster taming the t-rex episode so i think i just missed it at some point which is pretty funny too oh my gosh um, it's hilarious but I, and the reason why i wanted to bring them up the people are probably going to think that like they pay us or something like that. We have this like well, no, it's joint a, partnership it's or something. Pod, it's a podcast crush going on here. Yeah, right. Like, but um, 
but I just think that their chemistry together is really good. And when they did this episode, I thought it was really well done talking about a sensitive issue, but also bringing some humor to it and talking about movies that they have seen and talking about what's going on in Australia. And I kind of like listening because I just like what's going, know what's going on in other parts of the world. Yeah, like, I feel I, like it makes me smarter. <laughs> and I, and dear God, I just love the Aussie accent too. So yeah, they sound uh, f- hilarious. Yep, those blokes, I won't call them boys or guys, those blokes are great. <laughs> well, they use the C word all the yes, time. Yes, they do. Yes, and they do. You know, I'm sure we're eventually, spoiler, we're hoping to one day do a joint show with them. Yeah. Um, I can just imagine how often that C word's going to get thrown around on that show and other other inappropriate things. It's going to be like kids yep, release that Chuck E. Cheese on sugar. <laughs> yep. North America meets Australia and the <laughs> awkward dialects between the two. <laughs> It'll be great. It'll be great. But anyway, I, I wanted to give them a shout out because I thought that episode's really timing to what we're talking about right now. Yeah, it, de- uh, it definitely is. Uh, and I will have to give that one a uh, listen because, yeah, somehow I just missed it. Like on Because I haven't been listening daily to my shows like I used to. So our main topic of where we're going to – we're going to kind of build off of – our previous episodes. So if you haven't listened to episode four about creature features, episode three, is it three? Yeah. No. Oh God. <laughs> three. Just kidding. This is episode three, Wait. four. Yeah. We yeah, don't even yeah. know what we're on. Yeah. We're on four. We yeah. don't even know what we've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> Tells you how greaterly organized we are. So if you haven't listened to episode three, please go back and listen to that prior to listening to this one, simply because the, what we're going to be building off of is off of that segment. Yeah. And it will probably make it a little bit easier. So what we're doing here. So last time we talked about eco horror and we just talked about natural creatures. So for example, we talked about Cujo uh, because Cujo is a beautiful St. Bernard Rottweiler because they use a Rottweiler in that film too. That gets rabies. We also talked about Jaws. We also talked about Anaconda. Lake Placid, I think we did touch on... Um, a couple other movies where the creatures that country. Were, that country grizzly where they're not necessarily mutated so there hasn't been any kind of human involvement to make them different than what they actually are so in this episode we're going to be talking about when that has happened so when there's been some kind of human intervention yep do you want to add anything before i jump into my vegan horror notes um no, pretty uh, well. Actually, the only thing I'll say is they like you were saying, use our third episode as kind of the uh, buffer for this because all of my opinions that I like, my opinionated piece that I had at the end there on the last episode, still stand for this as well. Like okay. I have like everything that I said about those films, what makes them good in my opinion, fit perfectly for this as well. Absolutely. So what you're saying about the development and production and stuff in the previous episode, we keep here. Yeah. Scott hasn't changed his mind. Nope, not at all. He d- he doesn't like, oh man, we should have more robotic looking figures. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Bring on the crappy CGI. Um, so I'll start off then with the creation of vegan horror, which I think by far is the coolest thing I have ever heard. Yeah, this was interesting when you sent me the article. So, okay. Rewind. When we talked about the farm, and and also other podcasts have talked about the farm. We talked about the veganism side of it, right? So I, I was wondering when I read this article on veganism horror, which is, you know, called The Learning Spirit, Spectacle, Pedagogy, and Vegan Horror, what vegan horror was. I, I think it's really, really cool. So vegan horror orla- overlaps with both eco-horror and animal revenge categories. Like eco-horror, it imagines the chickens coming home to roost and like animal horror, horror cinema, it foregrounds questions of agency and destabilizing the distinction between man and beast with an emphasis on hybridity. So the idea of something being mutated or further developed. However, vegan horror goes further in presenting narratives in which the humans are treated as though they are non-human animals, making visible variations of absurdities of specimens, and it tends to focus on a material construction of these categories through social processing. Now, this is very, very heavy academic speech. Like, it almost sounds like a PhD dissertation that this person is writing, right? But what I pulled from this was vegan horror is the idea that 
the animals are the superior. We have done something. They become hybrid. They are the superior. We are beneath, and we are trying to survive them, not the other way around. Because in the vegan world, um, for those that are vegan, I'm assuming, you, don't, you, you see animals as equal, and you don't want to eat them. Right. Right? You, you believe that they're on the same level as you, and you think it's cruel. So it's a very interesting concept because it does refer to some of these movies in this article. And I think it's a great discussion on whether vegan horror is a thing or not. I'm not saying, Oh, you know, it's, this is how it is. And there's all these movies follow vegan horror. It's just a very interesting concept. And you can of course take what you need from it. So what I'm taking from this is the animals are seen as above. We are seen as below. And there is now a reverse predator situation. And it's because of our influence of whatever, chemicals, whatnot, have caused the animals to become above us. So if we go on that kind of concept, um, if we look at the movie Frogs, which was brought up to us by Mr. Donnelly from 1972, um, as evident through swamps are numerous indicators of pollution. So, so this movie is basically about pollution and pesticides and they make the animals, I guess, on steroids, pissed off, whatever you want to consider them. And they take revenge on a plantation. They yep. fight back. And they all fight back. Alligators are fighting back. Frogs are fighting back. Snakes are fighting back. Everyone's fighting back. <laughs> it's one big fight back party. And it's a reverse of here, the animals were below, the, the humans were above. We have inter introduced this chemical into the environment. And the roles are shifted. Yeah. Have you seen Frogs? I did. I actually watched it this week. And what did you think? Uh, I thought this was like pretty much what you said. That is a perfect description of, uh, yeah, the role reversal. Um, this also could have just fit in our natural animals attacks because they weren't really mutated besides just being aggressive. Well, no, it does say that they were exposed to pesticides. Well, yeah, I'll say they were exposed to yeah. it. I mean, like you didn't see any like actual physical mutations. So I think the idea is that the pesticides made them more aggressive which would have been technically yeah. a mutation right but you're right. right like it could go either way yes yeah, i could have fit um, in that one but yeah this it fits perfectly with this vegan horror stuff right here absolutely and i think we chose to put it in and really you could put it in any section like we're not here to tell you what sections the frogs fall into but i think if you look at the fact that we introduced a chemical into that to that environment they became stronger than us and they took revenge and yeah. even in you know so spoilers we will be giving spoilers for the frogs piranha the bees um what are uh, the other ones prophecy prophecy congo mm -hmm. bats the ruins black sheep stung the descent the attack of the killer tomatoes uh <laughs> jurassic, i can't even say that with straight face jurassic world and did you have other ones that you wanted to declare our spoilers for yep uh them uh the original godzilla from 1954 the host, uh, what was a uh, island of Doctor Moreau, the Fly, uh, the eighty eighties uh, Cronenberg remake of the Fly, and yeah, I'll give out spoiler warnings if I talk about other movies because some of those will just, I'll be bringing off the top of my head to discuss as we go on. And we'll also put in the notes as well. Scott did an excellent yeah. job of that last time. So these are the films that we will be talking about scenes, possibly endings of. Um, so please, if you if you really are sensitive and you're, you plan on watching The Frog from 1972 and you don't want to know what happened, then don't listen. Um, <laughs> or go back and watch The Frogs and then come back and listen to us. Uh, so in the final scene of The Frogs, you see the, the plantation owner sitting there in his chair as these frogs are just overtaking the house. You know, they're they're falling through the windows and they're everywhere and he swarmed. What is more vegan horror than that, according to the right. definition that we've read, right? According to the definition that we've read. Um, and then piranha. So in the original piranha, they're they're like this is so US, like Cold War. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like Russians are coming any minute. Better be prepared for the Soviet anyway, um, or Soviet Union or whatever. And, and anyway, the Cold War, and they had engineered these, these piranhas so they could endure the cold water of the North Vietnamese rivers. And because they did that, of course, you know, they people run off through, these, through this area. Some kids get 
they find these piranhas or they find this pool. They don't realize piranhas are in it at this military base. They jump in it. They get eaten. Someone goes looking for them. And of course, a dumb person releases all the piranhas into the water, like typical horror dumb story. <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> You know, typical seventies, right? And there's a and the, what I love about this is the random sex scene too. Like, there's some movies we've seen recently where like people just meet and then they're like, "Hey, you want to bang in the bang?" And I think it's hilarious. Right. It's <laughs> like, I mean, I wish that was my life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to talk after the show, then, right? We see what we can do. Well, I don't know. We've met each other many a times now, right? But <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> um, but yeah, like they always like meet each other, know each other for five minutes, and then they have sex. It's hilarious. But anyway, um, not that there's anything wrong with that. Nope, but, not at all. Uh, so back to the Piranha movie. So after they have sex and they realize that these piranhas have been released or whatnot, and they're going down the river, and there's a part where a, a young a young boy and his dad are out in the canoe, and the canoe gets flipped over because the dad's trying to pull something out of the water, and the little boy's on the canoe, and he's trying to hold on, and his dad gets eaten, and they're trying to get to the kid. It was a very, like... I kind of felt a little intense, not overly, but I can imagine in 1978, like you were like, oh my God, are they going to make it to this kid? Like, are they going to kill this kid off? Yeah. Yeah. They, cause back then they had no uh, qualms about killing children, whether on screen <laughs> or off screen. And they're like, you kid, you fall in the water, you get eaten by these piranhas. Yep. <laughs> and it's, you know, such a story, like the main protagonist, his daughter happens to be at a summer camp that's just down the river and there's also a resort and the piranhas are heading there. And every time you hear them feasting, they're like, nee, 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 nee. <laughs> Oh, it's in the amazing. Background. Um, but yet again, we're looking at these piranhas never would have been there. They never would have been these aggressors if there wasn't this concern for a, the cold war and the need to have a special weapon. And human interference, right? So yet again, we're seeing where the animal becomes the predator and the human becomes the prey because of human influence. Yep, exactly. And they're no longer killing out of instinct. Like piranhas do kill to eat. Like that is a real thing. Um, When I went to Las Vegas once, they had piranhas there on display. And you can read all about them. And there's only like three or four in the tank I think they had. But they're not... Like, they're, they're not like the movie, right? Like, they don't, right. like, hunt around and look for people. Yes, they are attracted to the smell of blood in the water. Um, yes, they do have razor-sharp teeth, and a pack of them will obviously devour a human. But in these movies, everything is amped up, right? Like Oh, for sure. Frogs, to go back to frogs briefly, frogs are the depictor of the ecosystem. Reptiles are, right? So if there's frogs somewhere, it tends to be seen as a healthier area. So I think it's really interesting when we see these animals turning against the humans that help, or or sometimes that purposely made them what they were, or through their actions made them what they were. I think it's just a really interesting exchange of power. Yeah, it really is. So the only other movie that I'm going to go into detail in and then maybe scott and i can do some more back and forth is the bee okay the bees so (laughs) this is a 1978 film and i watched some of it i couldn't get through all of it spoiler oh wow really yeah it's not a bad film it's just it's a clearly you know lower budget film so it's about a mixed string of bees that come to america where they create issues Hmm. Does this sound familiar? So this was in 1978 that these hybrid bees were made and they were coming up to America. And of course they swarmed, they killed all those kind of things. Right. So above, above average aggression of bees, um, they would kill other bees like honeybees and stuff like that. So in 2002, there's a little fear in North America called the African killer bees. So African honeybees are considered an invasive species in the Americas. So when we say the Americas, we mean Canada, United States. Um, I guess that would probably be it. Probably Mexico a little bit too, but mostly UNES, United States and, and Canada. Yep. Um, and as of the 2002, the Africanized honeybees had spread from Brazil south to North Argentina, North to Central America, Trinidad, West Indies, Mexico, and then Texas, Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico, Florida, and Southern California. Um, I can remember this. I don't know if you remember this, Scott, but I remember oh, I do. the fear of the killer bees. Yep. It was a legit I, thing. 
Yeah, I would say because even here in Michigan, like people were terrified, like worried that especially during the summer, like that we would have those types of bees around. And what were we worried about? Were we worried they were going to swarm us and kill us? Or were we worried that they were going to kill off the natural honeybees or the native honeybees? I think most people had a fear that they would kill us. Which is wrong. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) What we should have been more concerned of is the environment. But humans are egocentric. They are. Yes, they are. Right. Um, But without the bees, we don't have an environment. That's why we have such a push nowadays for um, honeybee sanctuaries and stuff like that, because they do a lot of regulations of our environments. But I thought that this was so interesting that this movie came out in 1978. And then in 2002, we have this fear of the the African bees and even an article of the killer bees. a, A journal was written about their gradual moving since 1956. So they have been known about since 1956. So that could definitely be where the fear was coming from. But what was happening is that there was more stinging incidents and a street and a drop in honey production, forcing many beekeepers out of business. So I work for the University of Guelph, which is a huge um, animal-based research university. I talked about this last time when I talked about the spider stuff that we do at the University of Guelph. We also have a honeybee sanctuary, for real. And we have colonies and colonies and colonies of honeybees that we are breeding to try to bring back into the environment. And we actually, if if you come to the University of Guelph and you attend a conference or you do a speaking, you get a jar of honey. (laughs) Oh, nice. <laughs> like, legit. They give you a jar of honey. Um, so it's it's a real issue. Honey production and the production of bees. And I don't think we realize how much of our food has honey in it because honey is a natural sweetener, right? So I think it's so fascinating. And again, this horror movie reflecting society that started in 1956, we had this concern about these Africanized quote unquote killer bees. And here we are having a movie in 1978 and multiple other movies. We're going to comp- um, add a link to all the different B movies. I think there was literally like five B movies about bees that like swarmed and killed people. And really what we need to be most important was scared about is these bees killing off our honeybees. Yeah. The invasive species part of it. Right. Or, or, in this case, it's the bees so, being so aggressive that it's too difficult to get honey. Because yeah. obviously, when beekeepers are going to get honey, I don't know if you've ever seen this in person, they're fully closed. They have a net. They have to remove the honeycombs. Like, it's actually a really cool process. Yeah, it is. Did you ever get it? Have you gone and seen it? I have not seen it. Like, I have not seen it in person. I've seen a, a couple of videos on it. So, like, as a child in Canada, that's what your field trip is. Like, you get to go to a honeybee thing, and you get to see honeybee and colonize and stuff like that. Okay, Like, it's like a big thing here in Ontario. I don't know why, but we really care about our honeybees. So, probably because they're so important to the environment, but... Um, but yeah, it's, it's something that's really, really interesting. So I think it's really cool yet again, horror reflecting society. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually pretty, uh, interesting. Cause I, I, I'm surprised by some of the articles you found that linked into these things. Cause yeah, I had, I was struggling to find some stuff for my, some of the movies I was going to talk about surprisingly. Well, I, I had more of a trouble before, but I found that now that I'm kind of narrowing my search, and plus I do have access to a grad school library, so it does allow me to kind of get to, because I the school pays for it, right? So I, oh, I get true. the journals and the subscriptions and stuff like that, that the, you know, unless you were going to pay for those, then you wouldn't get. So, you know, I'm using my grad dollars for good work. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and then I talked about prophecy as well, but I know you watched it. I only kind of read about it. Do you want to chat more about that one? Uh, yeah, because this one uh, definitely deals, once again, with uh, introducing a chemical, like a it's, a, it's a natural chemical, like, well, I don't even call it chemical, but mercury, ends up getting introduced into the waters of this uh, land where the indigenous people live, and all of their animals start mutating to, like, from being either in the water or drinking the water. And so you get to see like a tadpole that's the size of a cat. And that's crazy. Yeah. And salmon that are like bigger than a cat as well. And just like, and they're all deformed in a way. And then, you know, the big showpiece to that was the bear. And the bear is absolutely horrifying looking. 
and it's mutated and has mutated babies and all this stuff. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much like these, this logging company like does everything that they're supposed to do to, you know, make sure they're being environmentally friendly. But there was one aspect they didn't think about with the mercury ended up going into the water. And mercury is poisonous. Like, yeah. That's... And so like, that's how they find out a lot, a lot about this. Like, but man, like, yeah, the, the whole, uh, uh, what would you call it? Like the sub, like the invasion of nature with uh, human industrialization. Yeah, like it is like such a fitting movie for that to explain it. Like I, because yeah, I can't really explain too much because obviously I was watching this while I was working. But <laughs> 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 but yes, I. Uh, this this one is like one of the prime examples of like the mutated creatures due to human interference and becoming more powerful right yes like they have become like extremely aggressive extremely powerful stronger bigger faster maybe uh it was kind of hard to tell in the movie on that one but yeah like we were basically the ones that were in danger at that point once again the roles were reversed the egotistic role right yep now, is there any of your movies that you want to tie into this part, or do you feel like your part's a little more separate? Um, mine is, uh, it doesn't go with the vegan horror aspect. It's more okay. of man interfering type deal. So I will finish up the vegan horror part then with a couple other examples. So adding to our our previous uh, episode that talks about the 1960s and Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, uh, which really was also the prophecy was about that, right? Like chemicals going to the system and, and modifying our wildlife and our water life, kicking our ass back. Yep. Um, there was also Blood Beach. And the reason why I pull out Blood Beach is it's about huge creatures that, huge creatures that emerge from the sands and are caught on camera. And it, they resemble worm-like Venus flytraps. And the tagline was, just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water, you can't get to it. So talk about a play on another famous movie, right? Yep. Right? Good old Jaws. So I thought that was just really interesting, this whole concept of what we can't see and they overcoming us and these creatures developing and coming from from underneath us and, and not even be able to see them. And Congo, Congo is a little bit of a cheesy film. I don't know if you've seen Congo recently. Uh, it's been a long time, but like I still remember parts of that pretty well. You know, I remember the tagline, Congo, where you are the endangered species. And I remember <laughs> like that was when I think WWF was really beginning to, not the World Wide Wrestling Federation for all my wrestling fans, the World Wildlife, I think, fund um, started to really kind of market themselves, I think, more effectively mainstream. I, I know they were around before then, but I remember... Um, the endangered species piece of me being like, Ooh, what is that all about? And like, I was 13 when this came out or 12 or whatever. And uh, part of the concept is this, is humans have overbred these gray gorillas for their violent tendencies to protect, protect diamonds that they were. Yep. Devastating. And then the gorillas kill them all. Right. And I think that that yet again, humans interfering, overbreeding, getting too many of these gorillas, these gorillas, because gorillas are smart. People yeah, don't realize how intelligent gorillas are. Um, one of the when I go to the Toronto Zoo, we have a gorilla there named Charles, and Charles has been there for almost like twenty five, thirty years. And, and Charles oh, wow. is the head; he's he's the boss gorilla. And they will actually remove younger males that are born there because obviously uh, Charles fathers a lot of the baby gorillas, and when the males get too big and they, and they challenge Charles for dominance, it really stresses Charles out. Like Charles will sit in the corner and he'll pull out his fur and he'll do other such things. Like gorillas feel stress and they have hands and they can work tools and they feel emotions and they feel bonds to family. And it's, and they get mad. Like it's, it's a really cool thing to go and learn about gorillas. Yeah. So it's, it's not so far off to think that you couldn't have these gorillas get together and, overthrow a group of humans like it could be possible girls are very strong and be very vicious jane goodhall was very lucky that nothing ever happened to her i don't believe anything ever happened to her i hope i'm being correct with that um but like it is a very they're they're very powerful strong creatures and they're smart so i think congo played on that very very well and then we have bats i love bats oh my god i love bats so much i haven't seen that since i was 
freaking teen. No, I mean like I actually love the oh, bats. Oh, the creep. Yes, I yeah, so do I. Oh my god, they're so cute. They are. They are absolutely oh, adorable. People that don't like bats, I get it. Like they look like little flying rats, but oh my god, they're so important. So important. Um, so anyway, in this movie, bats are genetically modified by humans to become more intelligent. Um, so they wouldn't be endangered being extinct. But then what happens is, of course, they begin to attack and they, because they're modified, right? We, yep. We've given them more power now over us and they begin to attack in packs. The ruins. So this is interesting because it talks about plant life. Yeah. Um, and this one was a very clever movie, the way it was done. It was. And you cared about the characters. Yeah, you really did. Right? Um, so these group of Americans go to Mexico. I believe it's Mexico or Brazil. Uh, yeah, I believe so because it's like the Mayan temples. It's the Mayan temples, right? Yeah. And they go onto this Mayan temple, and once they're on there, they can't leave. They become basically a sacrifice for the plant life that is there that I think is spiritual. So I don't think we modified that. So I guess it maybe doesn't fit completely. We don't really know why it's it's hungry, but basically what happens is the vegetation becomes the aggressor. Um, and I think it's a really, really gory, slow, painful death for a lot of these characters. Like, it is... It is messy. Yeah, and just the fact that the plants, like, can mimic sounds and just by, like, rattling their stems and all that stuff and even, like, mimic cell phone uh, ringtones and stuff like that. Like, it, it's really creepy. So it's almost like how much human influence is there then, right? You know, yeah. like where where is the line to what humans have influenced these plants? And it tends to be, my understanding is tourists that they sacrifice for this. Yeah. Like that's who they tend to. Unless, of course, a local ends up being cursed and they have to execute the local, um, which does happen. Really, really well done movie. And yet again, we're vegetation. And it's not like Little Shop of Horrors, which ends up being an alien. Um, but this was like true vegetation kind of just fighting back, which I thought was really cool. And then there's also the comedy Black Sheep. Um, Love this movie. It, yeah. Um, carried out secret genetic experience that transformed sheep from docile vegetarians into ferocious carnivores whose yeah. bite can transform a human into a bloodthirsty half sheep monster. Yeah, good old <laughs> were, were sheep. <laughs> right. But as yet again, we're looking at human involvement, modifying and changing an animal that is a vegetarian. And, and sheeps are pretty like chill. Like, I don't know if you've ever pet a sheep. Have you yep. ever had it? Like, they're so soft. They are. And they are, yeah. like, the most docile creatures. And, like, I like to go and, like, squeeze their wool. Not squeeze them. Squeeze their wool. Okay? Yeah. I don't hurt sheep. Um, and they just, like, put up with it. And they're so cute. Um, I like to go to this. We have a donkey sanctuary near where I live. Um, oh, nice. For rescue donkeys. And they have sheep and stuff there, too. Oh, my gosh. Like, I'm such an animal lover. I should just open yeah. a sanctuary. Well, that's why I say you and I will have to go, like, to some of the places out here because I'm the same way. And we love this stuff. Anyway, so I think that's, yet again, another example of where modification of animals have caused them to push back. And then stung um, is the final one that I found. And that's about thanks to illegally imported plant fertilizer mixed with growth hormones. Yep. Uh, which yep, seeps into the thing. ground. A local species of parasitic wasp mutated into significantly larger creatures, right? So yet again, it's because of us. And, it, and the movie um, was cited as talking about capitalism and environmental dangers. Absolutely. You know, we continuously put these chemicals into our, our systems, into our streams, into our plants, and then they fight back. And they're like, oh, no, you didn't. And this is what we have. And then I guess what I'll throw in finally is the attack of the killer tomatoes, more or less because I thought of the song. Ah, the killer killer tomatoes. Tomatoes. Mutant tomatoes that attack people. Yep, for genetically engineering to make larger tomatoes, I think it was. Plantation, <laughs> right? Gotta deal with these plantations. So anyway, these are all examples of chemicals um, and our influence fighting back. Yeah, I was saying those are excellent examples because and I have a couple movies that kind of tie into that that I'll bring up right now. Like uh, these ones are more gen uh, gene splicing more than like just like man-made things happening but like yeah like we're definitely once again interfering with nature the movie may not be the best but is a good example of this uh i have never seen the original but i am talking about the 90s remake of the island of dr moreau mm -hmm. which 
everyone knows is one of those so bad it's good films because it's just known for terrible terrible production and like a lot of stuff that happened behind the scenes which i cannot remember the documentary but it is on netflix or shutter and i highly recommend watching it because holy crap the stories that you hear about that movie yeah this one you know it's about a guy that pretty much uses animal genes to splice with humans and he creates these humanoid hybrids of different types of animals like cheetahs and rams and uh cats dogs hyenas like you name it it's pretty much uh gene spliced into it and he treats them as like slaves he calls them as children but he treats them as slaves they have he has shock collars on all of them oh. and whenever they act up he like pretty much some makes them submit to him and well they finally have enough they figure out a way to get rid of those collars and they all rise up and take down the tyrant and once again just uh humans messing around with something they shouldn't be messing with playing god and well it comes back and bites them in the ass because well, for one of course as humans especially someone that likes to play god they think they are a higher being and worthier than the subjects that they are working on. Now, I just thought of this because I, I I put Jurassic World at the end because I wasn't sure where it fell. This falls in this type of category, oh, doesn't it? Right? Like, and I and when I and I won't go too much into Jurassic Park because we all know the Jurassic Park. You know, the first one <laughs> spared no expense, and it's all basically <laughs> Jennifer, <laughs> except for you know all the security and what happens when the power goes out. Exactly. Um, but. It, all those dinosaurs were believed or found from from fo- you know fossils or whatever that we believe those dinosaurs existed but in the lost not the lost world jurassic world they come up with one and i wrote down the name indominus and, rex yeah and i remember them saying it's a mix between a raptor a t-rex, t-rex a mixture of lizards like it was like a hodgepodge yeah, it somehow had the cloaking device of Predator. <laughs> yes, yes. And then, like, it has that badass fight scene at the end with, like, the T-Rex and the one remaining raptor and the water dinosaur. Anyway, sorry, we just spoiled Lost World. Hopefully, or, like, Jurassic World. Hopefully you've seen it. Um, we just spoiled it, though. My bad. Um, but, yeah, so I guess that would fall under this category, too, what you're talking about. Yeah, once again, humans playing God. Though yet again, we don't we don't fully know what dinosaurs like. We have an idea what dinosaurs look like and and stuff like that, and and we have people that are very smart that do the research into what they behaved and stuff. So it'd be interesting if like a hybrid like this ever could be created. And I always wonder one day if like they'll actually do Jurassic Park. It, it seems like it the way they keep going. <laughs> you know, and I feel like we've seen why that's a really bad idea. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but people don't pay it. People think the movies are fake, but right. you know, some of these movies have a uh, reasoning for it. Yeah, and another one, since we're on to the topic of like gene splicing and whatnot, uh, another one that is really, really well known, and this one is, well, this one is more like an accidental gene splicing, but the David Cronenberg's The Fly remake. Oh, yeah. Because, yep, this one, you know, he... He's a scientist that has created these teleporting pads, and he keeps experimenting and experimenting, and finally he wants to try a human subject in it. So, of course, what does the scientist do? He does it himself. And when he does, unfortunately, a fly ends up coming into the pod with him, and it pretty much deconstructs your DNA and rebuilds you on the other side. Well, it deconstructed the fly DNA as well and reconstructed it with the human DNA, and then the transfer transformation starts slowly happening but once again like man interfering though on this one by accident yeah but i i felt that i felt that it fit pretty well in this category what a decline in that film yeah you know and jeff goldblum is so good in that oh he absolutely is that was probably one of like my all-time favorite performances of his and the makeup and like seeing him turn and oh, then at gross. the end, where like he's asking to be put out of his misery. Yeah, like it's heartbreaking. <laughs> it is, and she can't pull. The, I was like, pull the trigger. Yeah, like bitch, you need to do this. Yeah, this <laughs> needs to be done. <laughs> but man, what a good film! What a good film! Yep, one of my all-time favorites. Absolutely. And then yeah, now I will get back. Uh, we're gonna go back in time a little bit here, but uh, this is like the 
era of like the atomic bomb when we dropped it on Hiroshima and the fear of the radiation that these massive bombs would cause and what this played on especially on American fears like originally or well I guess I should say originally but in America there was a lot of those 1950s big monster creature movies like uh like the one I'll give an example of is them while it is a fallout from the Trinity Blast in New Mexico that transforms the ants into 18-foot armored monsters, is a, it's also a story about a father-daughter pair that of entomologists uh, that deduce that's happening to stop it. In terms of sensibility, the director, Gordon Douglas, is clearly a science nerd. He devotes an entire scene to the elder Medford's charmingly jargon-laden lecture about ant life cycles and uses the chalkboards and slides to pretty much show the audience, like, this like so they actually use like real science and stuff like that in this while you know also implementing the fear of what could happen if we continue to use these type of weapons you know hypothetically speaking but the one thing that uh it showed was that radiation had you know a dramatic effect on life itself whether it be human life or animal life with this it created these monstrous insects that became smart and they would communicate with each other and they almost, and it was a fear of war because uh, the ants had this armored carapace that could be looked at as like mobilized tanks. Yeah. The only way to destroy them was by using flamethrowers. So once again, another man-made invention to destroy something that we accidentally created. But this is just a one of the prime examples because there was tons of these types of movies in the 50s and the 60s because of the fear of this. Now, one that is like extremely famous that I won't get into a ton of detail because there's probably dissertations and everything else on it, but that is 1954's Gojira, or also known as Godzilla to us in America. Oh, look at you using the Japanese term. (laughs) But once again, that one was the Japanese uh, fear after the uh, bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, and it uh, pretty much created this radiated lizard and awoke it up from its depths. It just runs rampant through the cities. A horrible external representation of things that could be. Obviously, the Godzilla sequels, I won't get into because that's like a whole other topic. But So, but... full disclosure, and and Jerry, I hope you keep us on your network. <laughs> I have never watched a full Godzilla film. I well, think I watched the Matthew Broderick one. Oh, God. I think. Oh, I'm so sorry if you did. Um, And it's not that I... Don't want to watch them. I just haven't. You know, I'm not a big science fictiony person, right? Um, but now that we're on Kill the Cast, I feel like <laughs> I will because I'm well. afraid. And it sounds like it's a really <laughs> like honestly, it, I, I love the concept. It's right up my alley. Yeah, and well, you know, once again, like she said, Jerry, don't kill us. But I will recommend at least to you, Heather, just watch the original sequels. Are what about fun. the most recent remake? Uh, or retelling or whatever it is it's not bad okay. it's like it doesn't have like but i'm thinking like with your you know societal your love for societal societal horror and the impacts and stuff like that the original would be what i recommend because they don't use that storyline as much okay. in the remake cool but uh yeah like i'm not going to go into a bunch of detail because like i said there's dissertations there's podcasts like We'll let you listen to Killer Kaiju from Outer Space if you want to know oh, like, yeah. that stuff, because they'll cover that so much better than we will. Um, but another one that I did want to bring up, now this one I haven't seen, but it's uh, one that I figured needed to be discussed because it makes uh, a lot of sense, and it's a newer film, and that is The Host, which was a South Korean film uh, that used monster movie conventions to critique the environmental risks of military base, U.S. military ba- bases, referencing an actual 2000 incident in which U.S. military mortician Albert McFarland ordered a soldier to dump from mar- formaldehyde into the Han River. The host depicts a mutant creature emerging from the river and wreaking havoc on Seoul's populace. Since the monster is also believed to be a disease carrier, the Korean government and International Health Organization coordinate a militarized response designed to quarantine the population until they can kill the monster and decontaminate the area by releasing an American biological weapon called Agent Yellow. At times taking a surprisingly sympathetic view of the hungry mutated creature, Bong's film seems to suggest that 
The real monster is the U.S. military and a militarized international approach to biosecurity that uses force to quarantine, surveil, research, subdue, and further poison populations. That's interesting. Yeah, and it's perceived to be contaminated in addition to known problems associated with U.S. bases such as a camp town prostitution, noise, fatal accidents, and pollution. The hosts use a science fiction monster to dramatize the unforeseen but pervasive dangers of militarized bases and security measures. That article was The Dangers of Biosecurity, Jump Cut, a review of contemporary media uh, from 2009 by Husson Su. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. I think you did. I'll leave that. I'll I'll link that in the article or in the show notes. But yeah, I just I found that article. And I just thought that was really fascinating. It makes me want to find that movie and watch it because I remember seeing the cover to it and going, "Okay, this looks like something that I would watch." And I just never got around to it. But you know, I think you I think you make a really good point, and I think it's interesting that it's the U.S. bases, right? And I yeah. think that has to do with the fact that the U.S. has been such a major power um, for so long. And continues to be, which is why we're really hoping that you guys get better soon, because we really need the U.S. economy to <laughs> to bounce back from all this and keep rolling. Well, Heather, um, I don't know if we want to, though, because right now we're number one. <laughs> and things are much, much less worse. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> in all joking aside, I really do, because I, I think that this does speak to, even though the fear of the United States coming in, South Korea being uh, you know underneath North Korea, which is not a pleasant place to be, um, but I, I think that really kind of speaks to their fear and how much power the United States has, right? So, yeah. um, and and the fear of, you know, contamination by outsiders, also infiltration of outsiders. Like, it's a really, that's a really political movie. And it's a really societal movie. And I think that's really great that you brought that up. Yeah, because once I seen that article, I was like, this fits perfectly into what we're describing. Because once again, human interference and creating something that is unnatural because of it. Well, and also we always to talk about horror representing society and society representing horror. Yeah, you know, and and with that, and you're bringing up Godzilla, you're bringing up this, you're bringing up really good movies that are talking about fears that were relevant at that time. Even Piranha, when it talks about the Cold War weapons that we can use uh, to fight back, you know, like that's that's reflective of that too, right? So it's 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 interesting, and there's so many mutant creature films. I we chose a couple to talk about. There's obviously more than what we talked about here. These are just the ones we chose to focus on. By no stance are we saying they're the best. It's just the ones that we felt probably argued our points as much. So that's why we chose them. Um, the only one I want to add on here as a big question mark is in The Descent. 2000. Oh, yes. So in The Descent, it's a, it's a bunch of ladies that go cave diving, I guess, or yep. exploring, whatever you want to call it. Um, I guess not diving because they think they're just going to be walking through the caves and they come across these humanoid creatures that they deem crawlers and you don't really know where they came from. Yeah. They're just one of those things that could be out there that we never know about. It's kind of how they like how it's represented. Well, in in Megalodon, so, you know, spoiler for Megalodon as well, because we're bringing that one up. Oh, uh, the Meg or the Meg, sorry. Meg, because there was another one we called Megalodon. So it was called the Meg. Um, they go very like below Mariana's trench, and that's insane. Yeah, like we do not know all the species of life that is a that is on this planet. So it could be, in theory, possible that there could be things living in environments such as this that we have never seen before. So where where does this fall? I guess this is maybe a monster film. Yeah, this one. Um... Man, I, because yeah, this could almost fit in that monster film category or almost like kind of what we were talking about with the original, uh, like the natural monsters, because if it existed already, like we just don't know, like they don't give enough detail. Or we don't know if it existed and then it got enhanced. Right. Like we have no uh, idea. Could have just adapted, could have been some other creature that adapted to that type of living, but absolutely. It's, uh, that is a great one to bring up, though, for discussion for anybody in art like that listens that wants to bring it up. I know, like because I know there's quite a few of you that like are big fans of these of these types of genre of films that and that would probably know way more than even us. Oh yeah, like we are very um, infinite in our knowledge, uh, not infant, no infant, infantile in our not in our knowledge, yeah. and 
I think that this movie here, I think just puts a big question mark. And you know what? It doesn't have to go in one category. I'm fine with people thinking it goes in others, but I think it's interesting to discuss. Where did these creatures come from? Were they modified? Because at no point did I see that they were aliens yeah. or seen as for not from this planet. And I think that's also very egotistic of us to think that we've discovered every single, single creature on this planet. Oh, for because sure. Because we haven't. So, <laughs> um, and, you know, we've had creatures come and, come and go um, and be instinct, instinct and stuff like that. So I think it's just really, really interesting. Uh, that movie always, I think that's a big question mark. And I love to see people's thoughts in the Facebook group on where they think that movie falls. Yeah, so do I. Like, I, well, that would be a good one to have for just topic. Like, I may even bring that up once our episode releases and just drop that as a post because, like, sometimes I think people hear it, but they don't want to be the one to start the conversation. So maybe I'll just be the one to, like, bring up the topic and just see what everyone thinks. What a great idea. Awesome. Yeah. So I think this kind of sums up our, our mutated horror section. As we said, there's lots of other things that we could talk about. We did not go into great detail on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, yes, but that but, is one that needed to be brought up. But we do love them. I love the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie. Where, oh, I like, love that movie so much. Like, they're wearing the costumes and the pizza. Mm, pizza. Um, but like Vanilla Ice in part two. Go oh, ninja, my gosh. Go, ninja, go. Go ninja, go ninja, go. Oh my gosh, it's great. <laughs> and then like, oh, and and who's the guy that shows up? It's April and there's that other dude. Casey Jones. Casey Jones, right? And Shredder and oh man, those were great movies. Great, great movies. Yes, they were a lot of fun. So and they like and they kind of fit in this mutated uh beasts category pretty do, well just not they're, they're just not horror films. Yeah, they're not horror. They're scary when you're a kid. There's some scary <laughs> right. scenes. Um, but I wouldn't say that they're horror movies for sure. Definitely they don't fall in that category. But um, but yeah, I think this was a really interesting. I'm glad we broke this into subtopics because it's made it a little bit easier to digest and just talk about, you know, some different themes we found in society and movies. And we have, as I said, another a list of, of mutated you know, creature features, then that may not be all inclusive. Like we didn't go into the Sharknados. Um, I like Sharknado movies. I think they're really fun. We brought that up on the last show. I think they're cool. I think they're hilarious. Um, like two headed shark and all yeah, that I was stuff. Say, like, like, I dig it. Yeah. Cause there is a lot, especially like in the two thousands and above that deal with like genetic engineering and stuff like that. Cause yeah, like two headed shark attack, three headed shark attack, four headed shark attack, five headed shark attack. Or like Deep Blue Sea even. Yeah, Deep Blue yeah, Sea. Actually, yeah, that was what that I meant too, to bring right? it up, actually. And LL Cool J's in that and his bird. And and I even watched Deep Blue Sea 2. And I like Deep Blue Sea 2. Like, it's not the highest quality film. But I enjoy these modified animals, like, kicking ass. I just think it's, I think it's cool. Yeah, I'll say it's like the humans are, or the animals are getting a, Getting their revenge for everything that was done to them, and they the, val- the 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 role has changed. Yeah, the predator and the prey. Now, in some cases, the predator is really hilarious, like yeah. Piranha Double D. Oh my god! Like yet again, like that movie, it's funny, like yeah. it's funny. And it, the piranhas aren't mutated in that one. I think we talked about it in our last. Yeah, they were episodes. prehistoric kind of, in that we're, one. We're blurring, but oh man, that movie's hilarious. Like, well, these episodes are supposed to kind of blur together anyway, so that that's works true. Out. We're just we're, we're mutating them together, yes. so it's fine. <laughs> um, but I guess we'll move on to our our trailers and finish up. Yep. So we're going to jump into uh, two trailers. Um, we're kind of just looking at two indie films right now. I uh, found both of these on pophorror.com. Wanted to give them a shout out since I you know, I write for them and they are a good place for, they are avid supporters of the indie horror community. And with everything that's been going on, there hasn't been many new trailers that we haven't already discussed because mm-hmm. you know, no one knows, everything's uncertain at this time with release dates. Mm-hmm. So I did some browsing on the on the Pop Horror website, and I found one that looked pretty interesting, and it was called Root, uh, Rootwood, which is about two students who are hired by a Hollywood film producer to shoot a horror documentary about the curse of the wooden devil. This one, it looked like the students were also podcasters, which is kind of cool, because you don't really see too many podcasters in movies, uh, but it has uh, stars Felissa Rose as well, which Felissa Rose is awesome. And, uh, but yeah, this, this one looked pretty, uh, pretty interesting. And it had like that folkloric mythological feel to it. What did you think about it, Heather? You know, I think for a low budget movie, it could be pretty decent. 
Yeah, I'll say it looks like it'd be fairly entertaining. I think it's an interesting concept. You know, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Camp Brook or Cold Brook. Oh, yeah. We just saw, um, which will be interesting. You know, I, I'll watch it if I'm at home and it comes out. Why not? Right. I'll say if we, if we I, I love to at least support the indie horror films whenever we can. And we were talking about it on the horror cast. And uh, yeah, this this year has been a year for indie horror films kicking ass. Well, I think also with the theater slowing down on the release, it gets a chance for other ones to come out. Yeah, that too. That definitely really helps. Can I introduce the next one? Yeah, absolutely. So behind you, so two sisters find that two sisters find that all the mirrors in their strange aunt's house are covered or hidden. When one of them happens upon a mirror in the basement, she unknowingly releases a malicious demon. So this seems like a lot of different malicious demon movies and (laughs) some of them are really really good and some of them are really really cheese so we'll see which way this is going to go i'm excited for it i think it will be interesting i'll probably give it a watch if i'm home it's up in my alley but i i don't know how it will be it looks it looks like it has more money than um rootwood but yeah especially like that uh scene towards the end there was like a where the behind you tagline kind of comes into play with the mirror and I thought that was really creepy and kind of well done the way they did that and it has me like intrigued I am very curious about this one mirrors are creepy like oculus yeah creepy mirrors yep and well there's even that movie uh mirrors I think it was just called mirrors and then look away there's a couple ones that based on on mirrors and images and stuff but so yeah so I guess that's it this is where we're at Yep, I'll say not much else to like add here for the you know what we're looking forward to because well we're just looking forward to uh, socializing again. <laughs> yeah, you know social distancing at its finest. Podcasters unite. Um, we thank- were the originators of the social distancing. <laughs> well, you guys were. I just became a podcaster. I'm still, I'm still well, novice in this. You've game. been around for a little around a year now, so you're 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 one of us. Yeah, and coming to my one year anniversary. My birthday is coming up in a couple of weeks, and it was around yeah. uh, it was around that time a year ago that I ordered my Kill the Cast tank top. Nice, and they uh, let me come on their show, and I did Terrifier, and I remember being terrified, terrified that I was coming on the show to do Terrifier. Um, so and you kicked ass on that show too. Yeah, thank you. It was my first time. You know, <laughs> they were my first. <laughs> you always remember your first. I always remember your first. Like, hey, Kill the Cast was my first as well. That was your first podcast. My first guest spot. Oh, that's not the same thing as like your first podcast well, ever. It, it is when you're, because uh, when you're with the other shows that I did, they were with friends of mine. It was more comfortable when I knew them. Oh, Where these true. guys, I was kind of like you. You just knew them through social media. Yeah, I stalked them. That's that was the difference. Yeah, you right? you, got, you probably got to know them better than I did before I really joined. Uh, yeah, the probably. Cast for a guest spot. Probably, I I did know Jay pretty well. I actually feel like I know them pretty well. Um, well, you know, you are also really good at getting to know like the podcasters to a show that you really like you will like actually start stalk up them. conversations and stalk them yes yes i stalk I mean, effectively yeah being i mean i was one helps. of the stalker victims it's true being a female helps i feel like i'm less intimidating because i come a, i'm a female um and there's not many of us so yeah. like if a female talks to you, you're shocked in the horror community because there's so few of us um so true. So true. but but yeah it's been a year now and uh yeah, really, really grateful. Just really, really grateful and humbled by everything that's happened. And, you know, thank you, everyone, for your kind feedback and your kind words. Uh, Venom shouted us out recently on his most, on the most uh, recent episode of Fresh Cuts, where they talked about the hunt. And he had some really nice things to say about oh, awesome. us. Yeah, and I, and I really appreciate that because I really, Venom is someone who I respect a lot. I think he's a really, really good podcaster. And I really um, appreciate his professionalism and his sense of humor. And I enjoy working with him so much on any show that we're on. So that, that meant a lot to hear. Um, and yeah, I'm just really, really, really grateful that people like our show and, and that they want other episodes and they like hearing me share my opinion and bully Scott, you know, it's great <laughs> that I have an avenue to do that in. Uh, but yeah, wow. so I'm, I'm just kidding. Scott <laughs> and I have a really great time together. We, um, we really enjoy doing this and it's always fun to talk about horror stuff. So thank you everyone for listening and, you know, take care of yourselves. Okay. Like we're all going to get through this. It's going to be fine. Um, one day at a time. Yep. Whatever you do, just 
keep your six feet away. Keep your six feet away for now, and just stay safe. And don't over buy toilet paper anymore. You yeah. should all have enough motherfucking toilet paper. So and by the end of this, we'll, whoever has leftover, we're all going on a teepee. We're all going to start going out teepee in people's houses. You know what I think is that if you have too much toilet paper, you should be forced and shamed to hand it out at Halloween. Ooh, yeah. Right? You go up to a pen someone's house and trick or treat, and they give you fucking toilet paper. <laughs> Oh my god! Can you imagine? Uh, well, hopefully, we're trick- I think I think things will be back to normal. People keep saying it will never be back to normal again. I I don't believe that. Um, I I've... I think that we will adjust to a new frame of life, but I I think we will get back to going out to doing things, and I think the economy will suffer, but it suffered before. Yep, and we came out of that as well. You know, um, there sorry, will be. Some, I'll say there will probably be some changes. We'll still, we'll still have a s- semblance of what we used to have. It's just going to be a little different, not I th- drastic. I think so, but you know what? So was so was stuff after September 11th. You know, I yep. And and not to go too into deepness here, but the only other time the border between our two countries was ever closed was for 20 minutes after the September 11th attacks, and that was consensual, and this was consensual. You know, we've closed our borders for tourism travel to keep both of our countries safe and you know trade is still going through essential services are still running supply chains are still running which are important um and flight travel isn't the same now since september 11th no that is one of the things that really changed right border services are more spiced up since september 11th and september 11th was a horribly tragic event and by no stance am i saying like oh it's in the past but we are now almost 20 years past september 11th yeah. And our society crazy. is still continuing to function. You know, the good people of New York are still functioning as well. And I'm not, you know, saying that every tragedy is the same. Of course not. You know, people that lived through the Great Depression and people that lived through the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan probably feel very differently about different things. But I do believe we'll get through this. And, yep. you know, I do believe things will go back to a, a normal way of life and that we will learn the lessons that we've learned here. I'm a very positive person, okay? So someone yep. may be listening to this and being like, ah, oh, Heather, you're full of crap. <laughs> and that's fine. <laughs> like, you don't have to buy what I'm selling. I'm, I am totally cool with that, you know? like yep. I'm drinking your Kool-Aid, though. You know, I, I, and, I do, and I do believe this is serious. Scott and I talk about it every day, and I follow data, and I look at numbers and, and stuff like that. I'm very interested in more the economy than anything else. But let's we're all in this together, and let's try to be a little more positive. You know, let's try yep. to... Let's try to talk about like, you know, other things besides that and, and be, and be here for each other and talk about, Hey, you know what, when we do go back out to see movies, Hey, you know what, when we do go back out to bars and Hey, you know, when we do go back to do those things, like the border will be open again for tourism one day, like everything, exactly. you know, it, it's, it's going to be okay. And I'm going to go make my money ran in Michigan <laughs> their economy as much as I can. So, yep. And I'll say, uh, you know, everybody we're here. We are all here to support each other, to help each other. So let's just continue doing that. And, you know, as podcasters, like, yeah, we are just like insignificant in the world. But, you know, if this helps you get through your days in isolation, that means that means a lot to us because we want to like help try to help you forget about some of the stuff that's going on. And we want you to love Scott and I. Yeah, you know, love more us. than anything, we, <laughs> we want to be your number one podcast choice, and you'd be like, "What would Scott and Heather do?" <laughs> Just kidding. Or at least, what would Heather do? <laughs> what would Heather? She do? knows what she's talking about. That Scott guy doesn't know what the <laughs> hell he's talking about. <laughs> but in meantime, I think the only thing I think close with is good night and good luck. Um, it's a famous quote from a 1950s podcast uh, broadcaster, but yep. our 60s or something like that. But anyway, good night and good luck, and thank you for listening. And see you in your dreams.